You can be turning in your Bibles to the book of Genesis. Genesis chapter 2 is where we're starting. We're going to ground zero here. Genesis chapter 2. I want you to notice beginning in verse 18. And the Lord said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him and help me for him. And out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. And Adam gave names to all cattle and to the fowl of the air and to every beast of the field. But for Adam there was not found a help meet for him. The Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall be one flesh. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. Now, if you read back a little bit earlier, back at verse 15, after he created man, the Bible says this, And the Lord God took the man and put him into the Garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, Thou shalt surely die. Now you'll notice that God gave that command to Adam before Eve was even cr ever created. And of course it was man's job to pass along that message to his wife once that she was created as well. In chapter 3 we have the fall of man where Adam ate of the tree and it was given to him by his wife of all things. But the scripture says this in Romans 5.12, Wherefore is by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sin. Uh, they did a little study not too long ago trying to figure out what, who was ground zero of the COVID-19 or the Chinese virus here in the United States. And it was a Chinese man that had flown in, evidently, in Washington State is where they pinpoint this man. Don't know his name, don't know what became of him, what happened, don't know if he, he recovered from it or he died from it. Not sure what the story is on that. But they say he was the first one. Now, I doubt that all of the cases of this virus started with this one man. He was the first, but there were obviously others who came into the country from different ways who also were positive for the virus, and that helped to spread it. But you see, not everybody's died from that virus. But what Adam did caused every man to be born to die. Again, Romans chapter 5 and verse 12. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. What a pandemic, it's a death sentence for everybody. All because God said, don't eat, Adam ate, he died, and as the federal head of mankind, we find that death has been passed on to all men. Now, let's have a word of prayer, and we're going to get into this story of Adam and Eve and find some lessons that are very, very relevant for us today. Let's pray. Father, we come to you now in the name of the Lord Jesus, and I beg you again tonight for the filling of the Holy Spirit of God. Take the message as it's preached. Take the truth of Scripture and drive it home to hearts, we pray, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. I read an article the other day, true or not, I don't know. I don't know what to believe on the internet and what not to believe on the internet. But they said that the people of Wuhan over in China, after they were put into their homes for several weeks, and when they finally got released from their homes, that their, their divorce rate went up. Evidently, they found that it wasn't so easy living together when it really means living together all the time. And uh, who knows what it's going to be in the United States when all these shut down things where people are not supposed to leave their homes and so on, when that takes place. But what about Adam and Eve and all the heartache that they called, uh, caused? You realize that for Adam and Eve, they had so many benefits that we don't have. They, have it, they had an absolutely perfect environment. 
Here they were in the Garden of Eden, created by God for them. No sickness, no death. Uh, they didn't have any in-laws to deal with. Think about that. No mother-in-law, nothing like that for either one of them, for that matter. Uh, they were created by God. God spoke with them every day. God would appear in the garden and actually speak with them every day. What a close relationship with the Lord they had had. There was no wickedness going on around them to influence them. Vance Havner, the preacher of old, used to say America is a disaster area home-wise. He said the automobile took the family out of the home and the television brought the world into the home. Now, you got both of those things going on today. Of course, a lot of people are being made to stay in the home, but unfortunately, they're bringing so much of the world into the home by sitting there and watching, especially a lot of the trash and sin that they do. But think about this with Adam and Eve. There was no crime. There were no police. There was no pornography. There was no cursing. There was no alcohol. They had a much smaller Bible. It was just a verse or two. They were told that they were not to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The day they did, they would die. They were told to be fruitful and multiply. And that for the others to leave father and mother and cleave unto their wives. Uh, you see, and they were told that they could eat of every tree of the Garden of Eden except for that tree of the knowledge of good and evil. You say, preacher, what are some of the lessons we can learn from this ground zero? Well, number one is this. Simple obedience is what God wanted. God said, don't eat of that particular tree. Now, they had plenty to eat up. There was no food shortage. There was no need to run down to Walmart and buy all the food that you can possibly get so you can eat for the next year. God was going to provide for them, and God did provide for them. But something about that one tree that they were fine with until, of course, somebody tried to call that one exception to what they could do, tried to call that to the forefront of their mind, then they ended up eating it. All God wanted was simple obedience. If you go over to chapter 3, in verse 11, God has now appeared to Adam and Eve after their sin. It says, and he said, who told thee that thou wast naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat? All God wanted was obedience. And may I say that's what God wants today. He wants obedience. He wants us to simply to walk according to his word. In 2 Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 15, God gives a command to the first king of Israel, King Saul, that he was to take his army down, he was to wipe out the Amalekites who had created a great problem for Israel. And he took his army out and he did that. By the way, he was supposed to destroy everything, all the goods that they had, all the people, all of that. But he didn't do that. He killed most of them. He killed most of what they had as far as spoil was concerned. But he brought a bunch of it back, and he wasn't supposed to do that. God appeared to Samuel, the prophet, and said, Saul has turned back from following me. Samuel goes down. He says, you've not obeyed the voice of the Lord thy God. And Saul said, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord. And, Saul, and Samuel said, well, then what meaneth the bleeding of the sheep that I hear? And he said, oh, well, the people, they, they brought them back. Well, Saul was the leader. Saul was the one that was responsible. And he says, oh, well, they brought those back to sacrifice. Now, I want you to get what God had Samuel say to Saul right there. He said, hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord thy God? For obedience is better than sacrifice and to hearken than the fat of rams. What God wants is a people that will just obey him. As a matter of fact, Keep your hand here in Genesis chapter 3 and go over to the book of John chapter 14. You say, well, that was God the Father. What about the Lord Jesus Christ? It doesn't seem to matter so much to him that we obey him. Boy, you've not read your Bible very well if you're thinking like that. For you'll notice in John chapter 14 in verse 21, on the night before his crucifixion, Jesus said, he that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. And he that loveth me shall be loved to my father, and I will love him and will manifest myself to him. And then he says again in verse 23, Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words, 
and my father will love him and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. Now notice verse 24. He that loveth me not keepeth not my sayings and the words which ye hear is not mine but the father's which sent me. Jesus makes it very plain that if you don't obey him, you don't love him. That if you really love him, you will obey his word. Now, there are a lot of people, they can talk about, oh, how they love Jesus while they walk in disobedience to him every day of their lives. You see, Jesus and God the Father has made their will very, very clear in the scripture. And what he wants is obedience. You realize he wants the same thing from us today that he wanted from Adam and Eve back then. And that was simple obedience. Matter of fact, turn on over near the end of the Bible to the book of 1 John. In 1 John chapter 5, at the very beginning of the chapter, 1 John chapter 5, the Bible says this in verse, um, let's see, I'll find the right page here in a second. Notice verses 2 and 3. He says, by this, we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. Now notice this next verse. You might even mark it in your Bible. He says, for this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not grievous. The question that he asked Adam and Eve, have you obeyed me? Have you eaten of the tree? Have you disobeyed me? Have you eaten of the tree of the, of, uh, the knowledge of good and evil? And by the way, here's another lesson from this matter that simple obedience is what God wanted. And that is that disobedience always changes fellowship. They had met with the Lord every day in the garden. But when they heard the voice of the Lord walking through the garden, the Bible says now they hid. Why? They were ashamed. They were ashamed. That's what sin does. It makes you ashamed. I mean, if you're saved, if you've got the Holy Spirit of God living within you, and all saved people have the Holy Spirit of God living within them, you cannot sin without it affecting your fellowship with God. The Bible tells us this in 1 John chapter 1. He says, God is light, and in Him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with Him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. You see, you can't have fellowship with Him walking in darkness. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Yes, God still wants obedience on the part of his people, still wants obedience and sin, disobedience to his word, always changes fellowship. Now the term there is very important, fellowship. I said fellowship and not relationship. When I got saved, I became a child of God. And if you're saved, you're a child of God. And when you sin, your fellowship with him is broken, but not your relationship. You're still a child of God. But you can't have fellowship with him, that close uh, communion with him while you're walking in disobedience to your word. The reality is there's so many believers out there that somehow they've had a lot of false teaching. There are a lot of false preachers out there that somehow they've been told that under grace they don't need to worry about obeying him. Yes, you do need to be concerned about obeying him. I got news for you. When I was growing up in my home that I enjoyed my fellowship with my dad a whole lot more when I obeyed him than when I disobeyed him. He saw to it. And my heavenly father, the Bible says, for whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourgeth Every son whom he receiveth. Disobedience breaks fellowship. It changes fellowship. What does God want? He wants obedience. Also another point we learn from Adam and Eve is that excuses do not change the result. Let's go back to chapter 3 of the book of Genesis. And I want you to notice in verse 12. It says, And the man said, the woman whom thou gavest to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I did eat. And then in verse 13, it says, The Lord God said unto the woman, What is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, The, servant, the serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. So both of them had an excuse. Now the truth is, Adam was both blaming the woman, and he was also blaming the Lord. The fact that the woman gave him that fruit doesn't mean he had to eat of it, and yet somehow he seems to think that that's a viable excuse. 
And the woman, thinking somehow, because uh, the serpent had beguiled her, that that gave her an excuse not to eat, and yet they both knew that they were not to eat. So you get down to verse 17. And it says, And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow thou shalt eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, till thou return unto the ground. For out of it wast thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust thou shalt return." And then we know when he spoke to the woman, he spoke to her before that, he, he, said, he tells us what's going to happen to her. In other words, they could make all the excuses they wanted to make. It didn't change what the result would be. They're both going to die. And they eventually did die. Matter of fact, all of those after them have to die. You see, he promised death if they disobeyed him. Now, they're going to live for a while. But you see, they wouldn't have died had they not eaten. We wouldn't have died. We wouldn't have to worry about death had we not eaten. But see, death is a result of sin. Sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. James chapter 1. I'm just simply saying excuses don't change the result. They both tried to blame others. And by the way, your situation is no different. Wives, God spelled out what a wife is to be in the home. She is to be submissive. She is to be in reverence of her husband. And you say, well, my husband, he, no, wait a second, wait a second. You said I do, you married him. You can make all the excuses you want. It doesn't change your responsibility before God and you'll answer for your disobedience. Husbands are told to love their wives as Christ loved the church. They're also told to honor their wife as the weaker vessel. That husband that runs down his wife, he's not doing himself any, any favors. For you see, when you got married, you became one in the eyes of God. And excuses don't cut it. Men, you're the one who is responsible for the, the uh, situation your family is in. If you're in, a, in a, a backbiting, arguing, complaining relationship, husband, it's your fault. That's what the Word of God teaches. You are responsible. The point is, excuses don't change. It's amazing how many people give excuses for having a bad marriage for having a bad home life. But they see, they won't do anything to make it better. Oh, that's not to say they might not bring some flowers home one time, but that doesn't change anything. You have responsibilities. Get in the Bible and find out what your responsibility is. In, in 40 some years of being a pastor, I have found this, that most marriages where there are problems, it centers down to this one thing. The husband is an expert on what the wife's supposed to be, and the wife is an expert on what the husband's supposed to be. And you know, they'd make their whole home life a whole lot better if they forgot what the other one's supposed to do and started becoming an expert on what they're supposed to be. You know, there's no place where the Bible says the husband's the Lord over the wife. He is the head of the wife. He is the head of the home. He's not to try to become that. He is. So if his home's in bad shape, it's his fault. Kind of like in an army, you know, a general, if he takes his army out and they lose the battle and he can blame the captains and he can blame the corporals and he can blame the, pi the privates, but I'm telling you what, to the top brass, he's the one responsible for whether or not that army fought the battle right. Husbands, you're responsible. Personally, I believe in the marriage, the wife has the most difficult part. I mean, some of you men need to look in a mirror. I think you'll agree with me once you see that. By the way, not only do excuses not change the result of God's judgment, but there's also the law of sowing and reaping. The Bible says in Galatians 6, 7, and 8, Be not deceived, God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. I mean, after all, you take the farmer, he puts corn on the ground, it's corn that's coming up. He puts wheat in the ground, wheat's what's coming up. How silly would it be for a farmer to put corn in the ground and then complain that he got corn and not wheat? You'd say, dummy, you got no business being a farmer. You put corn in the ground. Corn is what's going to come up, not wheat. You're going to reap what you sow. And in your home, in your life, you're going to reap what you sow. You sow disobedience, and you're going to reap the results of that disobedience. 
Then, of course, there's also the chastening hand of God. Quoted the verse a moment ago, whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. That's a promise from God. So simple obedience is what God wanted. And excuses do not change the result. Then you've got sinful actions always affect others. They disobeyed God. They did wrong. Now, at that particular point, there are no sons, there are no daughters. It's just Adam and Eve. And they could say, well, this is only on us. No, no, it's affecting me today. I'm going to have to die because Adam and Eve, way back then, disobeyed God. As a matter of fact, everybody ever born through the line of Adam, and that's everybody, has to die. Again, wherefore is by one man... Sin entered into the world and death by sin, so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. i tell you what, it's absolutely amazing to me, these people that drink and they say, well, listen, uh, that's my problem. Nobody else should be concerned about it. Well, tell that to the people that are maimed and killed on the highways. Tell that to their loved ones by the drunk drivers that are out there. And by the way, you don't have to be drunk to be affected. One drink affects the brain. It's as simple as that. One drink. You say, but I won't be drunk yet. I think I, all drunks think they drive better when they're drunk, but they don't. I remember when I was pastoring up in Manchester, Tennessee, I'd preach at the Coffee County Jail on Sunday mornings and uh, before the Sunday school at our church. And uh, so the first thing I'd always say on that Sunday morning, because I knew there'd always be people in there that had been picked up for DUI the night before, and I'd always say to the men that were seated out before me, I'd say, let me just say right off, if you're here for DUI, I thank God they caught you. I'm glad you're here. This is where you belong. Because when you got in that car after drinking, you put my life in jeopardy. You put my wife's life in jeopardy. You put my children's life in jeopardy. I thank God that you are here. Well, they might not have liked it, but it always did get their attention. I mean, they sat up and paid attention after I said that. Now, I had a lot of scowls from that as well. But I wasn't just glad they were there so they could hear the preaching. I was glad they was there to get them off the road. Now, that's just drinking. Every other sin that's committed. You take a husband or wife that's unfaithful, it just doesn't affect you. It doesn't just affect your husband or your wife. It affects your children. Listen, I come from a broken home. I understand that. And my mom and dad may have thought their sin just affected them, but it didn't. It affected me too. It affected my brothers and sisters as well. You understand, nobody sins to himself. No man is an island. You can't sin without having an impact on others. Here's Adam and Eve. They're the only ones in the world at this time. If anyone, it seems, could have ever said, well, you've not got no right to say anything. To us. It's only affecting us. They didn't realize it. It affected everybody. As a matter of fact, you remember they had two children, Cain and Abel, to start out. Two boys, Cain and Abel. And they grew up. I wonder what it was like when they finally got word that Abel was dead. Abel never would have had to die had Adam and Eve not sinned. He wouldn't have died. And then I wonder if they saw any of their other children die, knowing that each time one died, that was a result of their sin. Listen to me, mom and dad. Listen to me, husband and wife. Listen to me, young person. You say, well, I'm not married to anybody. It doesn't affect me. I guarantee it affects you. Uh, your sin affects your friends. You're either a good testimony or a terrible testimony to your friends. Nobody sins to themselves. It always hurts others. It's amazing, you know, one of the biggest killers of teenagers is suicide. And I don't think they, they have any clue. They think that they commit suicide. Everybody's just going to be weeping and crying. They don't realize how many people are going to be angry with them for the rest of their lives because of what they did. You say, no, no. They'd feel sorry for me. No. And, uh, and by the way, they'd be angry about you. And some of them would be so tremendously hurt because you did it. Suicide is so dumb anyway. It, suicide has a number of problems. Number one, it is a permanent solution to a temporary problem. I mean, all the problems that they may go through are only temporary. They're going to pass. But you commit suicide, you've ended it all right there. You're done. You understand, and it's going to affect other people who have to live with that memory the rest of their life. I'll tell you something else, they're not even thinking about the person that's going to find them. 
and the grotesque pictures. I remember I was uh, visiting a deputy sheriff. He had been a deputy sheriff down in uh, L.A., lower Alabama. And uh, he, had, he had a, uh, I'm, I'm trying to call it, a photo book. In the photo book, he had pictures of all the different suicides that he had been on as a deputy sheriff. I, I could only look at a couple of photos. I couldn't look at the rest of them. Grotesque. People had no idea how other people are going to find them and how grotesque it'll be. And then I'll tell you, people who commit suicide have no idea what it's going to be like when they meet God. I'm just simply saying, sinful actions affect others. Parents, get this. Are you a gossip? Are you a criticizer? Do you harbor unforgiveness? Is that the kind of home you want your child to be brought up in? Uh, are you a cursor? Are you a slothful Christians? I know parents paying the price today because they thought as long as they threw things at their children that that would be enough and all they did was ruin their kids. Wouldn't make a difference how mom and dad lived, how cruel that they were to one another. Just as long as I show my kids I love them, I'll get them a brand new car. I'll get them a $40,000 car. Uh, you, whatever. I, I'm going to give them everything they want, and that'll prove to them that I love them. Why don't you give them a good home? You know, that's what they'd really want. A good home. It means making some decisions. It means working at marriage. I think part of the problem is too many people have been taught that the Hollywood lifestyle is normal. And they think this is what love is. It's, ooh, this, all, this, all this feeling just driving. No, no, no. Love is far deeper than that. If you can only love somebody when you have a deep emotion uh, now and then, then, dear friend, you don't have a clue what love is. Love goes far deeper than that. How do you treat one another? By the way, mom and dad, your kids see you. They hear you. Man, I was brought up in a home of drinking and cursing, and I don't know how many of the nights as a child, after mom and dad would be out for a night drinking, I would be laying in bed, and they'd come in the house fighting, yelling, cursing one another, saying the most awful words to one another. And I'd lay there as a little boy and just weep my eyes out. Yeah, you parents, time you wake up and understand there are other people in this world besides you, and you will impact your children. God wants obedience excuses do not change the result sinful actions affect others something else by the way about this ground zero family each child is different if you go over to chapter 4 of the book of genesis the bible says in verse 1 and adam knew eve his wife and she conceived and bare cain and said i've gotten a man from the lord and she again bare his brother abel and abel was a keeper of sheep but Cain was the tiller of the ground, had the same mom and dad. Here they are, the first two brothers. So they're brought up in the same moral system. Mom and dad. And yet they're as different as can be. One's a tiller of the ground. One is a keeper of sheep. They're different. I don't care how many kids you have. They're going to be different. Children are different. They're going to be different characteristics. I've got eight grandchildren. Six of those are boys. They're all different. They're different. They've got different strengths, different weaknesses, diff different things that they're interested in. They're different. Different in what they wanted to do in life. They're different in how they responded to God. Uh, they, <laughs> weren't they a success with Abel and a failure with Cain? Well, no. These children are different. I mean, after all, uh, here's Cain. He brought a sacrifice to God, but it wasn't the right sacrifice. Abel brought a sacrifice to God. Both of them brought a sacrifice to God, but one brought the right sacrifice. The other brought the wrong sacrifice. I mean, Cain was your typical Christian today. Our churches are full of people who simply say, well, I'm me. If God doesn't take worship the way I want to worship him, then he'll just have to do without it. Will you rebel? What's wrong with you? Are you apostate? Jesus said that God is a spirit. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. The truth is we're supposed to worship him, worship him his way, not our way. 
and we will be the happiest and most content with life and have a life that really counts for something when we decide we're going to live like he wants us to live. But here's Cain and Abel. Their worship, totally different. By the way, that's the reason some people hate us. We believe worship is to be done God's way, not the world's way. It's not the flesh's way. We're to do it according to the word of God. We're to worship him according to the word of God. Absolutely amazing to me. People will take music that appeals to the flesh completely, drives the flesh from the dancing. I mean, listen, I was a rock and roll disc jockey. I can remember, and by the way, that was in the latter part of the 1960s, country western disc jockey, first part of the 1970s, and I got saved uh, right there in the very beginning of the 1970s. I saw the disco craze come in and the nightclubs with the lights and, uh, and with the smoke machines coming up. Never would have thought back then that, that stuff would be in churches today. Nobody would have even conceived such a thought. I mean, anybody in the world would have looked at that and said, you know, there's no way that can be godly. Because all that stuff does is simply feed the flesh. You see, we believe at Madison Baptist Church that our walk should be according to the word of God. So some will call us legalists. We're not legalists. We believe we're saved by grace through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. But that doesn't mean that God hasn't set up a standard that we're supposed to live by. We don't live right in order to go to heaven. We live right because we're going to heaven. We see, we want to please the Father. We want to worship Him in a way that He accepts. Now, no matter how different children are, some things are still the same. They're still to obey God. Ecclesiastes chapter 12 and verse 1 begins by saying that it's good for a child. I'm sorry, I just lost it. It was in my memory a second ago, and I just lost it. So let me go to Ecclesiastes. And in Ecclesiastes chapter 12 and verse 1, you can be turning there too with me. It's right at the end of the book, the last chapter of the book of Ecclesiastes. Verse 1 says, Remember now thy creator in the days of thy youth, while the evil days come not, nor the years draw nigh, when thou shalt say, I have no pleasure in them. So he says, Remember thy creator in the days of thy youth. There's a reason why God says we're to bring up our children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. It's all right for one to be a tiller of the ground and another one to be a keeper of sheep. That's okay. It's all right for one to be a, uh, a woodworker or an artificer. Uh, it's all right for one person to be a ditch digger, another person to be an office worker. That's all right. That's okay. Nothing wrong with that. But you see, they're still to worship God in holiness and in righteousness and walking according to his word. That doesn't change. So you get to the end of the chapter. In verse 13 of chapter 12 of the book of Ecclesiastes, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be bad. See, children are different educationally, temperamentally, vocationally, and in personality. Now, uh, let me just warn some of the Christian parents, don't get caught up in the weird stuff. There's a lot of different thoughts about some very strange stuff that's out there. You've got people saying, well, I'm going to pick the husband or wife for a husband or wife for my children. I'm going to do that because after all, Abraham uh, picked the wife for his son. No, he didn't. You didn't read it very closely. He sent a servant to go pick a... So you're going to hire a servant to go out and pick a spouse for your son? You better be careful about that. There was a movement going on. Each parent needs to bless their children because that's what Jacob did. Now, Jacob wasn't a very good Christian most of his life. Uh, and, and that's what Abraham did. He blessed his child Isaac. Oh, nothing wrong with blessing your children, but it doesn't mean you have to write a special... And you're not going to write a prophetical blessing uh, that is from God because, number one... There's no new scripture being written. God recorded those blessings on purpose because God wanted those in his word. He's not going to do that. By the way, when it comes to marrying, do you realize in the Bible there's a real variety of how people found husbands or wives? Uh, for instance, there's those with parental choice, like Judah for his son Ur. That didn't work out too good for Ur. Uh, then some with wisdom, like Pharaoh, uh, picked a wife for Joseph. And creation, God picked a wife, actually created a wife out of Adam. Now, that'd be something if we had to do it that way, take a rib out of somebody to make a 
why, but we don't deal with that. Uh, conquest. You remember when Caleb wanted the city of Jerusalem to be taken, and when Othniel took it, then he went ahead and felt that Othniel had, had earned his daughter for his wife. Uh, vengeance. You remember that Saul gave, um, gave his daughter to David to hopefully be a snare to David to get him caught. Favor. In 1 Kings chapter 11 and verse 17, Pharaoh for Hadad. Now, some of them took a wife. It was by choice for Abraham. He chose Sarah, according to Genesis eleven twenty nine. 29. There were Israelites who got wives through conquest. We don't believe in that. Deuteronomy 21, 10 through 13. But that's what the Israelites did right then. Uh, catching a wife. Benjamites did that in Judges chapter 21. Of course, most people that go out and catch a wife found out that she was really the one catching him all along. Uh, then there's contest. That took place for Esther, you'll remember, in the book of Esther, chapter 2, with King Ahasuerus. It was uh, his choice, and then by communion uh, with her choice in 1 Samuel chapter 25. Jacob earned a wife. Wait a second, he earned two wives. Got the concubines on top of that, and that created some major problems in his home. Then there are some who found a wife, like Eliezer found a wife for Isaac. And then there was the Lord's favor, Proverbs chapter 18 and verse 22. You got some who purchased a wife, like Boaz purchased Ruth. And of course, that's what she was wanting all along. And of course, Jesus purchased the church with his own blood to be his bride. I'm just simply saying, don't get off in some of the weird stuff. It's amazing some of the things that are taught because somebody did it in the Bible, therefore we're all supposed to do it. And God didn't sanction all those things. He accurately records the things that took place. Now, as I said, all children are different. Remember, what God wanted from the first two, Adam and Eve, was obedience. What he's wanted from everybody since has been obedience as well. Children are different. Excuses are not going to change the result. And I want you to get this last point. Children are responsible for their own decisions. I had a preacher ask me several years ago, he said, Pastor, how do you explain this? He says, uh, he says, how do you explain five kids brought up by the same mom and dad, same home, same rules, all of that? Four of them live for God. One of them wants nothing to do with God. How do you explain that? Because a lot of people, when a child goes astray, they want to blame the parents. I got news for you. You got a child that goes astray, it's their fault. I was brought up in a drunkard's home. Why am I not a drunkard? Why am I not a drunkard? Why did I get saved at the age of 22? I made a choice. I found out I was lost and on my way to hell and Jesus Christ was my only hope. I made a choice to take Christ as Savior. Now you'd think it'd be easier for a child brought up in a Christian home to make a choice for God. But easier or harder makes absolutely no difference. If children die and go to hell, it's not mom and dad's fault, it's the child's fault. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. He that believeth not the Son shall not see life. The wrath of God abideth on him. Parents, understand this. You ought to try to be the best parent you can be. You ought to try to be the most godly parent you can be. You need to bring up your children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. But what God never takes away from your child is free will. They have a free will to accept Christ or reject Him. If they die without Christ, they'll burn in hell. And I can't think of a greater burden on any family than having a son or a daughter that are without God. And it's obvious they're on their way to hell and you want them to get saved, but you can never make them get saved. And let me say for any child out there, any young person out there, you may try to blame all your problems on your parents, but friend, if you've not taken Christ as Savior, it's not because of the hypocrites that you saw at church. It's not because your mom and dad weren't everything they ought to be as a mom and dad. It's because you decided not to take Christ as your Savior, and that is on you. By the way, if your parents weren't all that they ought to be, Christian or not, if they weren't all that they ought to be, then you would think that that would make you decide to be everything you ought to be as a parent. Instead of using them as an excuse, use them as a motivation 
to be everything you ought to be. And you can never be everything you ought to be as a parent until you take Jesus Christ as your Savior. You see, the choice is yours. You could accept him today and have that free gift of eternal life. But understand this, young person, that you're responsible for every decision you make. You make a decision to get drunk, that's on you. It's not on your parents, it's on you. I mean, hey, there are a lot of things I could have done I didn't do because I just simply wanted to do right as a young person, even though I had a mom and dad that weren't doing right. And I'm not mad at them. I'm not angry at them over that. Listen, they were lost. They didn't understand. They didn't understand God's truth. Now, I didn't know God's truth until I was 22, and thank God I learned it then that I needed the Savior, and I took Jesus Christ as my Savior. And I realized even more how much God simply wants obedience. Mom and Dad, He wants obedience. Ground zero to every problem we've got, including this pandemic. Right here, Adam and Eve, Genesis chapter 3, when they decided in the midst of a perfect situation to disobey God. And when they did, we have been facing the result ever since. But you can come to Jesus Christ and he'll give you eternal life. You can come to him today. As we come to the end of this service, I'm going to pray in just a moment. But let me say, dear friend, if you'd like to know Jesus Christ as your Savior, I don't care what you've done, don't care what your background is, don't care what your race is, don't care where you're at socially or financially or anything like that at all. If you'll come to Jesus, he'll save you and give you everlasting life. We have men right now at the telephones who'll be glad to take your call and share with you from the Word of God how you can have Christ. They'll pray with you. Tonight you can have this matter settled you're going to heaven when you die. I trust you'll call. Our telephone number is 256-830-6224. 256-830-6224. Call now. Turn off the computer. Call now. And they'll be glad to tell you how you can have Christ as Savior. Christian, you need somebody to pray with you. Maybe to pray with you about your children. Pray with you about your family. Pray with you about your walk with God. We have people at the phone, staff members, who will be glad to talk with you. 256-830-6224. Father, we thank you for this time again to share your word, to share your truth to people by way of live streaming over the Internet. Thank you. What a day we live. That even when we can't meet together like we used to, we can still get the gospel out literally around the world. Bless the message to hearts. May some poor lost sinner, may they right now decide they're going to get eternal life. They're going to take Christ as their Savior and have their sins forgiven. Have a brand new life in Him. Oh God, do a work, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen.